Today we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. A proclamation is an expression of worship. And that as we proclaim the gospel, it encourage us, encourages us in our faith and encourages others in their faith. And this enhances our ability to worship. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today to look into your word, to see what you have for us. We pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us, that it wouldn't be the mere words of a man, but that you would come into those words and make them alive for your purposes in our individual lives and in our corporate life. Guide and direct us. Help us to be open to hear from you. And we, may we receive from you that which you have for us today. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is what Paul writes. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But, that, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motive or true, Christ is preached. And because of that, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Remember Paul's story. Paul was proclaiming the gospel. Some trumped up charges were brought his way. He was arrested. He was questioned. And then he got a little bit upset. Paul got upset because he was a Roman citizen and they had beat him and they had jailed him without due process. He was upset about that. He was also upset that being jailed was keeping him from doing what he wanted to do. He wanted to go to Rome to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted to strengthen the church that had already been established in Rome. He wanted to get there. But now he was in prison. And he said, you know, this is bothering me. Forget you guys. As a Roman citizen, I have the right to appeal my case to Caesar. And so he got his ticket to Rome. But his ticket was on a prison ship. And eventually he got there, and he was imprisoned, and he was put basically on house arrest, which meant that he had one soldier chained to his left hand and another soldier chained to his right hand 24-7. They had shifts where they were chained to him. He had freedoms because he was on house arrest, but he was restricted because he was in chains. He was chained to his guards. Some people would say, oh, man. His ministry's over. And Paul, as we will see, saw that as a challenge. And the challenge that he had, can you imagine? You're a Roman soldier. You're built for battle. You're trained for battle. And you're chained to this guy. And all he does is talk about this guy named Jesus. 24-7. Whenever he's awake, he's talking to people about Jesus. They're coming to him, asking him theological questions. You don't care about that religion, but you've got to hear it. And think about the prosecutors who have to present the case before Caesar's court. They have to dig into the theology of Judaism, and they have to dig into Paul's theology and his beliefs. What's he been saying? They have to study it so that they can bring accusation against him and get the guilty verdict. So Paul's seeing how his chains are actually an avenue for God to reach out to people. And he wants to tell the Philippian church that he's doing okay because he's in the center of God's will. Proclamation was the key thing on Paul's heart. He wanted to proclaim the gospel. And it's a word that we can use in the construct of worship. 
Because it's as we proclaim the word of God, as we proclaim what he's doing, not just the Bible, not just standing on a street corner reading the Bible, not just standing on a street corner telling people what you believe the Bible to be saying, but the way that we proclaim Christ in the way that we live our lives. In our daily conversations, we live and speak of the way God works in our lives. And proclamation then, when we do that, when we tell other people how God is working in our lives, it encourages them and it strengthens them in their faith, which then gives them an excitement when they come to worship. Think in your own life. When people have been talking about what God has been doing in their life, doesn't it kind of get you, and I'm going to use a word that's probably dated, but get you giddy? Get you giddy for the things of God and how he's working? And when you bring that into worship, how it excites you and allows you to enter into a different kind of phase of worship? So proclamation can be used to enhance our worship. It's something that we should be doing all the time. We should be telling others about the Lord. We should be living in a way that they can see the Lord lived out in our lives. But it also is important because as we tell the truth of what Jesus is doing in our lives and in the lives of others that we're encountering, it encourages us in our faith. And Paul basically is giving us an example. And the one thing that he's, the one part of the example he's giving us is the proclamation is to be done everywhere and anywhere. Sometimes we get at the idea that only preachers can proclaim the word of God and it can only properly be done in the church or for those street corner evangelists, that's okay, they can do that too. But there's certain places where you proclaim the word of God. And Paul said, uh-uh, because Paul wasn't in the pulpit of some prestigious church. He wasn't asked to come in and speak as the, as the honored speaker to stand up in the pulpit and proclaim the word of God. No, that's not what he was doing. Paul wasn't preaching on the street corner either. Though he has done that, this particular message that he's writing to the Philippians about the work that God is doing in and through him in his prison, the house that he's living in, chained to the guards, he's not on the street corner preaching. Paul was in prison. How many of us thrown into prison and thrown into the prison honestly, unjustifiably, how many of us would be preaching or proclaiming what God has done and what God is doing? How many of us would be complaining on how our rights were violated? You know, Paul could have been complaining about his rights being violated, but he didn't. He didn't. He was sitting there using that time to teach others about the love of Christ, to teach others about consequences. You know, we can always complain. We were taking the grandchildren back last week to meet their mom, and I'm driving up 36, and then I notice some lights flashing behind me. <laughs> and eventually get pulled over, and of course the grandchildren are, Pappy, what's going on? You know, and I said, well, guys, I wasn't paying attention. What do you mean you weren't paying attention? I said, well, I wasn't paying attention to the speed limit law. What's a law? I said, it's a rule. Oh, okay. And I wasn't paying attention to the rule, and so the police officer has to come up and remind me that I wasn't paying attention. So he comes and he gets my stuff and he goes back to his squad car. So the questioning keeps going on. Well, why did the policeman come and talk to you? I said, because he's reminding me. He's going to write me a ticket. What's a ticket? I said, it's, it's telling me that I wasn't paying attention and I'm going to have to pay some money to remind me to pay attention. And they go, oh. And I said, it's like when you don't follow the rules at home and mommy and daddy put you in time out to have you think about what you did so that you pay more attention the next time. Oh, so then he comes back and is willing to receive what I, because I wasn't paying attention. It was 45 at that, well, you know how that is on 36, 45, 50, 55, 45. I wasn't paying attention. So I, I, I told him, I said, I'm sorry, officer. I, I wasn't paying attention. I don't know how fast I was going. He said, well, you were doing 58 and a 45. And I said, okay. So, all right, I'm going to take that one. And he comes back, he says, um, is your address Pittsburgh? And I said, yes. He goes, okay. He comes back. And I don't know if he had some way of hearing what I was telling the kids 
Or if he just looked and said, he's an out-of-towner, but he just gave me a warning. And so the kids were saying, what happened, Pappy? I said, well, he was really nice to me. He, di he told me I didn't have to pay any money, but that I need to pay attention, especially because I have young kids in the car. You know, another day, I might have been grumbling. Oh, man, you know, those signs, just, they're just not visible. You can pass them up. And you know the law, the law in Pennsylvania, if the road's not marked, it's 55. So I wasn't really going fast that much faster. I could have been complaining, and I could have not used it as a teachable moment for the kids. But God, in his grace allowed me to teach my grandchildren something, as well as reminding me, you know, you can't just be involved in what you're doing without paying attention to what's going on around you. And that's what Paul was doing. He was saying, you know, I got these guys around me, and I've got people coming to talk to me. I'm not going to waste my time complaining that I'm here illegally. Because I'm going to use my time to witness for God and to tell them about how God loves them and how God wants them to live their lives. So proclamation is supposed to be done anywhere and everywhere. The circumstances don't matter. Paul wasn't in a small group Bible study telling them about the things of God. He wasn't in a group of friends just discussing in the things that God was going on. He was in prison. He was chained. He couldn't go anywhere without taking two other guys with him. How much fun is that? I'm sure that the length of chain was long enough that he could close the door to the bathroom, but that's about all the privacy he got, you know? I wouldn't very much appreciate being chained to two other people every moment of my life, but that's the way he was. And he said, you still got to proclaim. Even if you're in bad circumstances, you've got to represent Christ. You've got to represent Christ. And you represent Christ by the way that you speak about him and the way that you live your life and the way that you speak about other people. Paul said that his imprisonment served to advance the gospel. The word advance here is a military term. It's the term used of the engineers of the army who would go and find a new path into that new region. And because it's the anniversary of D-Day, if you've ever watched any of the movies, they had to breach the defenses that the Germans had set up on the beaches. And one of the ways that they breached those defenses, there were all kinds of barbed wire and, and, and cement bulkheads that they had to get through. They called forward the army engineers who had what they call Bangalore torpedoes. Basically, it's real long dynamite sticks that attach together. And they attach them, and they push it forward, and they push it forward, and they push it forward, so that when it explodes, it wipes a big hole in all the barbed wire, and it will punch holes through concrete reinforced bulkheads. And so they would do that. The engineers went forward, and they pushed those Bangalore torpedoes in until it blew open the passageway into new territory. They couldn't have gotten there without the engineers doing their job of blowing away the defenses. And so what Paul's saying is, God put me here for the advancement of the gospel to blow away those things that would prevent the gospel from reaching into areas that seem to be impenetrable. The whole Praetorian Guard, <laughs> trained soldiers, trained to kill, they weren't theologians. But because they all had to rotate, this is the palace guard, it's the elite, it's the green beret of the time. And because they had to rotate through the number of years that Paul was in prison being chained to him, they all heard and a great number came to believe. Who would have been able to speak to the Praetorian guard? How about the bank of lawyers that Caesar had that were going to prosecute him? If it wasn't for Paul, they wouldn't be spilling over the scriptures. They wouldn't be spilling over the words that he had spoken and the theology that he was preaching in order to try and prosecute him. These trained lawyers, these prosecutors, would have never heard the gospel if Paul wasn't in chains. So he said, he used me to advance the gospel, to blow a hole in these impenetrable defenses of Rome. He was in the heart of Rome and speaking directly because all the reports would go to Caesar because he was the one that would make the ultimate decision. So Caesar, who was reputed to be God himself, 
was hearing about Jesus Christ and his love. The audience doesn't matter. The circumstances, the location, the audience doesn't matter. Paul didn't say, you guys just aren't, you're just not worth speaking to. The audience didn't matter. He took opportunity to speak to whoever God presented in his life. Dr. Dunham, who wrote a commentary on the Philippians, was at a speaking engagement on the Jersey Shores, and the place was so beautiful it had nicknamed, it was nicknamed God's Beautiful Mile. So this place that's called God's Beautiful Mile, he and his wife are walking, and they see a park, they go into the park and there's some kids playing over here and, and there's some dogs playing fetch over here and there's a bench in the middle of the park with a lonely man, a man all by himself who appeared very lonely sitting there smoking a cigar. And they walk past that bench just as you or I would with the pleasantries of, hello, how are you? And continuing their walk and the man said, I'm doing terrible. And they go, oh. And the Holy Spirit pricked their heart. They went back to talk to him. Less than a mile away, and less than a block away is where he lived in a high rise for the elderly. His wife was dying of cancer that she didn't know she was dying, but he did. And he just was beside himself. He, hadn't, he said, I have nobody to talk to. I have nobody to, to listen to. I have nobody to unburden to. And they spent time listening to his story and then telling him about the story of Jesus. He received comfort from them. He received the grace of God in his life. She hugged him before they left because they took the time to speak to somebody who wasn't part of the audience they thought that they would be speaking to because he had an audience of 5,000 people at the campground to speak to later that evening. Somebody was touched and received the grace of God in their lives. That's the positive side of doing what God calls us to do with regard to an audience. I'm going to tell you about the negative side because it just happened the other day. You know, sometimes when God gets preachers up there and he gives them a message, sometimes the message is for them. And so I want to encourage you by something that I did wrong to follow God's leading like they did rather than me. We were in the emergency room at Presbyterian Hospital waiting for Karen and Dee Dee to get there. Butch was in the back. There was a family. A doctor came out, shared something with them. And the wife began to cry, and the family began to console her. And Nancy, the one with all this compassion, says, you need to go and pray with them. And they go, I don't want to intrude in their grief. You know, let's, let's give them some time to grieve. And she said, but, but, you know. And I said, yeah, but, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't want somebody intruding into my grief at that point in time. I wanted, and, I, and I put together a plan. I said, well, I saw the one family member go out to make phone calls to others. When she comes back in, I'm going to intercept her and ask if I can pray with them. Well, she snuck back in, and then they, by the time she got back in, that time frame had lapsed, and by then they were, they were calmed down, and they were talking, and they were joking with each other. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just leave it be. Because, you know, we get this. What if they say, get out of here? What if they say, we don't want you in our lives? You know, you put those things in your head. And then today, as I was reviewing, God said, Marvin, you, you blew this one, because what's the worst that could have happened? The worst that could have happened is they say, no, thank you, goodbye, get out of here. What's the best that could have happened? The grace of God could have been there to touch them and help them through their grief. You know, tell me that I didn't make a mistake. And God's called me on it on other occasions too, where I've passed somebody and I didn't take the time. Paul takes the time. Dr. Dunham and his wife took the time. Because the audience doesn't matter. The audience that you speak to and proclaim to doesn't matter. 
But some of that is because I didn't follow Paul's example that proclamation needs to be done in humility. You know, I was more concerned about my feelings than their feelings. Paul was always more concerned about others than himself. Paul was willing to preach even when there was opposition. He shared the gospel of Christ even there was opposition. He said that, he, that there were those who were in rivalry against him. That means to canvas for office. There were people speaking against Paul so that they could gain ascendancy in the important stature above Paul. So people would say, well, Paul's in jail. He must have done something wrong. He must not be doing what God wants him to do or he wouldn't be in jail. But this guy over here, man, he's just a rising star as a preacher goes. And so that he would be rising and he would be supporting that by having other people do that. That concept of selfish ambition that Paul was talking about. Paul didn't care if they were preaching because they were trying to better their position. Paul didn't care if they were preaching because they had selfish ambition. They wanted to eclipse Paul, and Paul could have cared less. He said, you have to have humility when there's cooperation as well. He said, he was preaching out of love, and that's all that he cared about. He said, preaching out of goodwill, even when the people that were out there preaching out of goodwill and love as well were not in full agreement with Paul. You know, there were a lot of people preaching the gospel, the basis of the gospel, and then their theological interpretation of how it should be worked out differed from Paul's. Paul didn't care. Paul cared that the gospel was being preached. It's known in history that the two great preachers of the 18th century, John Wesley and uh, George Whitfield, uh, didn't really agree theologically on a number of issues. But they were both used of God to preach to thousands of people and see many souls saved. One day a person was interviewing John Wesley and he said, do you expect to see George Whitfield in heaven? And John Wesley goes, absolutely not. And the interviewer was kind of taken aback. He says, oh, don't misunderstand me. By no means am I saying he's not saved. He's saved. The issue is, he's going to be so close to the throne of God, and I'm going to be so far away from the throne of God, that I'm not going to be able to see him for all the people in between us. Talk about humility. Talk about humility. And not very many people in the United States know about George Whitfield, But we know about John Wesley. You know, in England, they know a lot about George Whitfield, But here in America, we know John Wesley. We don't know George Whitfield unless, you're stu unless you have studied uh, preachers and the, and the evangelistic movement, the revival movement in England. But he said, no, gonna, he's going to be so close to the throne, I'm going to be so far back. You know, humility, humility, preaching from humility, the desire to elevate Christ, even as Paul was in chains. Even in chains, his whole desire was to elevate Jesus Christ. He said this, the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Proclamation is supposed to be done anywhere and everywhere. Proclamation is supposed to be done without regard to the place, the position or circumstances, or the audience. Proclamation is to be done in humility. And proclamation always produces results. Paul says that because I am here in the defense of the gospel and people are seeing how I'm proclaiming Christ, they're being encouraged and they're being strengthened in their faith and they're going out all the more eager to proclaim the gospel of Christ. They're losing that sense of timidity. Well, what if, what if? And they're seeing that because he's in prison and he's still able to stand for Christ, that even if they go to prison, they'll be able to stand for Christ. They're being strengthened. They're being encouraged because God is using using the vehicle of prison to bring salvation to men. He uses the vehicle of prison to bring salvation to men. The whole Praetorian Guard came to know about Jesus Christ. The prosecutors came to know about Jesus Christ. God uses our circumstances as vehicles to blaze new trails into what might seem to be indefensible places. 
proclamation brings encouragement to the fellow believers. It strengthens them and encourages them as we give testimony about what God's doing. Proclamation enlarges the body of believers as people get saved because of the proclamation. Proclamation brings the body of God together for worship. Because when you come together to share the things that, are God, that God's doing, that's part of worship. And proclamation produces joy. The greatest joy a Christian can have is rejoicing over the salvation of lost souls. You know, God brings joy into our lives in other ways. But the greatest joy that we can have is when we see somebody we know get saved and what that means for them and what that means for the body of Christ. As we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, it encourages us and others in our faith, which enhances our ability to worship. We're to proclaim anywhere and everywhere. We're to proclaim in humility. And when we do that, proclamation will bring results. And I gave you a negative example in my life. I gave you a positive example in Dr. Dunham's life. Where are your examples? And where can God encourage you to proclaim in life and in word, irregardless of the place, irregardless of the circumstances, but proclaim in humility, not saying I'm better than you or the gospel is better than what you think, but just saying Jesus loves you. And he's expressed his love to me in these ways. And can I work with you? Can I help you? Can I introduce you to him? You know, our lifestyle. We are sometimes the only Bible that somebody will read. How do you live your life? Do you live your life as a proclamation to the goodness of Jesus Christ in bringing salvation to your life? And then when we see people saved, we receive that joy. My challenge to you today is, to ask God to make you sensitive. And as he makes you sensitive, that he would help you to be humble so that you'll enter into those circumstances and situations that he pricks your heart to so that he can express his grace and love to others through you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. And Lord, Scripture gives us the good, the bad, and the ugly about how men follow you and women follow you. And so it's, it's not inappropriate to share the good that others have done in their following your calling and how others of us have recognized that we could have done better and we didn't engage as you wanted us to engage. But Father, just that sensitivity of knowing that gives us courage to know that the next time you bring that circumstance to our lives, we'll recognize it and we'll act upon it for your glory and for your honor. Help each of us, Father, to recognize the avenues that we can use in order to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to fo fellow believers and to unbelievers that they might come to know and experience the grace of God. And that in and through that, we would receive the joy that Paul received, even in prison, chained to the guard, even when people opposed him, so that Christ was advanced and no one else. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's greet one.